virgin most powerful radio sharing the gospel with clarity and charity and now virgin most powerful radio is pleased to present hands-on apologetics with renowned catholic author and apologist gary machuda And welcome to Hands On Apologetics. You have entered into the Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. I'm Gary Machuda, and welcome, everybody. It's great to be with you. Got a lot of great stuff to discuss today. Man, we are having a great week heading up to the weekend. And, uh, you know, we had earlier this week, we had Steve Ray, uh, Father Robert Spitzer, uh, Carlo Broussard, and today we have an awesome guest as well, Dr. Douglas Beaumont, comes back into the dojo. Talk about worldviews. And yeah, this is a very important topic, folks, because what is a worldview? A worldview essentially is something through which everybody understands the world. It makes the world a, a coherent whole, okay? So everybody has a worldview. I have a worldview, you have a worldview, everybody in the world does. And the important thing is to make sure that our worldview conforms to what is with reality. Otherwise, you can essentially be sane. I mean, sane people have a worldview as well. And uh, But, you know, there is also competing worldviews. There are people on the pro-death side, you know, that uh, have their particular worldview. There's... Uh, uh, Anti-Catholics have their own particular worldview. Different religious groups have their own religious uh, worldview, or actually just overall worldview. And uh, the question is, well, how can we help move people from uh, what they believe is reality to reality itself? How can we change that worldview? Well, Dr. Douglas Beaumont is coming on the show. We're going to talk about changing worldviews, what it takes to move somebody from where they are to where they ought to be. And uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun, a very, very important topic because it really comes down to what's involved in a conversion. And the conversions are always one of my favorite topics because uh, it just fascinates me to see God's work of grace in people's lives. And uh, also today we're going to do our Finding the Fallacy, which is the Ends Justifies the Means Fallacy. And also we're going to meet another early church father who is a pretty cool early church father named Didymus the Blind. Didymus the Blind. So uh, loads of fun in store for us today. And uh, I think one of the quickest hours on Catholic Talk Radio. So, so strap in your safety belts and uh, you know put on your apologetics helmets because we're going to uh, go through this thing that we call hands-on apologetics. And it's time for our shout-outs. Hello, everybody watching live stream on social media. That is live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Great to see you. Thank you for the emojis. Appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> hello, Jose, and everybody else. All right. So, and also, you know, thank you for tuning in, uh, for those listening on radio and also for those listening via podcast. And by the way, everybody should know whether at the live stream portion of the dojo or listening on radio dojo part or all the other folks that you can access all the programs, not only on the hands-on apologetics, but all the great programs that Virgin Most Powerful produces on our official website, which is virginmostpowerfulradio.org. And uh, just go in there, click on our shows, and select hands-on apologetics or any other show you'd like. And bang, there is all the shows that we did, all the shows this week, last week, and as far as I could tell, I think all of them are up there. And you could download it. You could share it with friends. And by the way, I highly recommend, you know, just part of the new evangelization, if you could, spread the word about Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Share us on uh, social media. Give us likes. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed because uh, there's lots of great stuff out there. Not only stuff that we do here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio, but also elsewhere in the church. And it's important to support each other, right? Uh, so, anywho... Uh, <laughs> Uh, this whole week is a best of, huh, Jose? 
You know, I feel the same way. In fact, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, the sensei is going to be off on assignment tomorrow and Monday. So we are actually busy, Richard and I, uh, scratching our heads trying to figure out what would be the a good best of program to have on. Uh, so, so Richard, I don't know if you caught that on the, the live stream stuff, but uh, Jose thinks all the shows this week should be on the best of rack. So that's thank you for that suggestion. I appreciate it. And by the way, when uh, Dr. Beaumont comes on the program, give us a call if you have any questions or comments at 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151. Love to hear from you. And also, you can also send your emails. Emails are great. Because not only is just questions, but maybe you might have uh, comments. Maybe you're in a situation that you would like to bounce some ideas off people or just share success stories or even share crash and burn stories. We learn a lot from crash and burn stories. You know, it's important to know what to do, but it's also very important to know what not to do. So send us your emails at questions at handsonapologetics.com. Love to hear from you. I do respond to all emails although not all of them make it on the air. And uh, we've had some fantastic emails in uh, the recent past. So, well, actually, all the emails I get are great. So uh, keep it coming, folks. Love to hear from you. All right, so uh, <laughs> enough fun and frivolity. Let's jump into our exercises. Let's sharpen our critical thinking skills, shall we? The finding of the fallacy today. Very simple. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Because the, the title pretty much says it all. The fallacy of the ends justify the means. Which basically means that a good outcome excuses any wrongdoings committed to attain it. In other words, you could do anything necessary as long as the end, the goal, is good. In other words, the goal justifies whatever you had to do to reach that goal. And uh, I don't even know if we have to really go into this fallacy. I personally think it's kind of... Um, Oh, self-evident uh, that <laughs> this is fallacious because uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, for one thing, a, a wrong action is a wrong action, regardless of why you did it. Your motives may excuse you. You may excuse your culpability, you know, your guilt for doing something wrong. Or it might lessen your culpability, but nevertheless, it is a wrong action. Uh, so the goal doesn't uh, alleviate that. And also... Uh, Thomas Aquinas teaches that everybody does something for a good motive or an apparent good, I should say, an apparent good. So even if you think the end justifies the means, it's like, how do you know that your ends truly is good? Because uh, people can use apparent goods. Things might seem right to somebody when, in fact, they're wrong. So that's our finding of the fallacy for today. The ends justifies the means. I think that's pretty much all the time we need to spend on it. Let's talk about the Meet the Early Church Father for today, who is Didymus the Blind. Uh, Didymus was born sometime around A.D. 131. He died about A.D. 198. He was born in Alexandria, Egypt, and uh, was blind from the age of four. Yet, uh, he became one of the most learned men in antiquity. In fact, he was one of the most prolific authors of his age. So there you go. That's, that's a fascinating fact in and of itself. <coughs> um, he was uh, studied under the great St. Athanasius, uh, and he was eventually made the head of the Catechetical School in Alexandria, Egypt. Now, if you remember, the Catechetical School is a very famous school, taught the allegorical understanding of uh, scripture um, it is very famous in the ancient world uh, and in fact you had Saint Athanasius you had Origen you had uh, all these great thinkers who were the heads of these uh, schools Didymus was the head and in fact uh, at his death the school uh, eventually it was removed to uh, from Alexandria to a place called Side uh, where it shortly closed so uh, he was among uh, probably the, one of the most famous teachers of the School of Alexandria, and he also had some very famous students, two of which we've talked about on this program, Saints, uh, Saint Jerome and Rufinus. So, uh, yeah, we talked about them. They all sat under Didymus the Blind. Uh, Didymus, by the way, was not an especially original thinker. 
but his prodigious memory enabled him to gain masterful knowledge in not only philosophy and theology, but geometry, uh, uh, astronomy, and arithmetic. Uh, his contem contemporaries of Didymus knew him as a man of considerable insight and extreme kindness. In fact, there's nothing in his writings that's invective. Which is kind of funny because his student Jerome apparently never caught that <laughs> because he's one of the most contentious early fathers in history. Uh, St. Jerome, you know, didn't follow Didymus in this regard. Uh, Didymus rather had a kind of angelic disposition to everybody, including heresies. He, he condemned heresies, but he never condemned persons. And consequently, he was well-liked and on good terms with even with the Arians. Uh, he remained a layman his entire life. Uh, he lived in a, as an ascetic outside of Alexandria, even while he was the head of the school. Uh, now, although Didymus was a fine early church father, nevertheless, uh, his Trinitarian he, uh, writings are, by the way, a model of soundness. And uh, his doctrines correct in general, except for uh, two unfortunate things that he picked up from origin of alexandria and you guys are familiar with origin and originism and all that uh oh, the pre-existence of the soul and the ultimate salvation of all uh, uh fortunately didymus kind of picked that up from origin and in the sixth and seventh centuries the writings of didymus suffered the same fate as those of avagrius of pontus uh he was anathematized because of his origin and tendencies so um there's no doubt uh, accounts for the f the accounts of the fact of him being a holy man uh he's uh, unfortunately he was never given the title of saint uh major largely because of these errors that later became a very um how can i say a very um difficult heresy later on in church history so that's didymus the blind Coming up on the other side of the break, we have Dr. Douglas Beaumont coming in to talk about changing worldviews. Stay tuned, everybody. This is Terry Barber inviting you all the men to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877 526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. 
If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. Hands-on apologetics. Changing worldviews. You know, changing the way which we look at the world, understand the world as a coherent whole. How is that done? Can we break it down into steps? What occurs when moving from one way of understanding the world to a very different way? Well, uh, Dr. Douglas Beaumont's coming into the dojo to help us kind of work through that. He himself had undergone such a change. Dr. Beaumont, by the way, received his Ph.D. in theology at uh, Northwest University, M.A. in apologetics from Southern Evangelical Seminary. Uh, he's a convert to the faith and the author of an excellent book. And uh, you, this deserves to be on your bookshelf, folks, because uh, especially if you love conversion stories, it's called Evangelical Exodus, Evangelical Seminarians and Their Path to Rome. He's also written several other great books. Uh, he's a popular speaker, a catechist, director of religious education. And he's also written some very good articles. So check it out on his website, www.douglasbeaumont, that's all one word, dot com and and dr beaumont welcome to hands-on apologetics hey gary great to be back on yeah it's, it's it's been a while it's i'm glad you are uh you know we're going to talk about changing worldviews and you actually you've changed your worldview quite a bit so i was wondering if you wouldn't mind maybe for the first few minutes if you could give us maybe a little um, um thumbnail sketch of your journey of faith Sure. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of a double convert. Um, <laughs> I wasn't really a, a, a Christian um, that I was aware of and, until right after high school. So you know, I was a legal adult by the time I, I entered into Christianity in any kind of full time way. Um, and I remained there for quite some time. Um, eventually, finishing a master's degree and pursuing a doctoral degree at the uh, Evangelical Seminary where I was teaching at the time, uh, which you mentioned. And uh, during the course of those studies and over a five-year period, I sort of found myself uh, reading my way into the Catholic Church and uh, having to, you know, really cut ties with, with virtually my entire um, faith network. Um, you know, of course, this affected not only academics, but also uh, church and uh, friend network um, and even my job uh, at the time because I was, I was teaching at the seminary by then. So um, yeah. that was a pretty major transition uh, to move into the, the Catholic Church, and now I'm uh, you know, serving in the Church, which is um, a great privilege, and um, I became interested in this whole idea when I, when I was um, reading through, spending that five years. Um, I came across a few resources that, um, very few, unfortunately, um, that actually talked about religious conversion on its own, and I, I found that very interesting. Yeah, uh, I find it just as a general topic fascinating. I, I'm, uh, I'll admit it, I'm a junkie of the Journey Home program and uh, conversion stories of that, because it's fascinating to see, uh, you know, how uh, certain things that uh, were never considered suddenly become considered, and then they become important, and then. Uh, you know, the, the people find themselves uh, kind of alienated from where they were, and and uh, you know, and and also, of course, you know, God's grace throughout that whole process is it's just fascinating to me. But uh, you're right, though. There's not a lot that break it down into uh, what exactly are the steps involved with changing, you know, from uh, where you begin to where you end. Yeah, I think t people tend to see it as as just. A single step, you know, it, it may be yeah. drawn out over time, but it's as if someone just has these two different um, faith uh, options in front of them, and they're just sort of studying until they pick one. And <laughs> yeah, right. With uh, <clears throat> while, while that is kind of the beginning and the end of the process, there are stages to the process, and different things are happening during those different stages. And especially if we're trying to help someone. Uh, who is going through the process, or if we are in it ourselves, um, noting what those different stages are, what is happening during those stages, what to expect, how to help, you know, what, what kind of support people need at each stage can be very valuable. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, uh, well, let's lay out some uh, terms and, and ideas, and then we can kind of map out uh, what's involved in, uh, I guess you could say, a conversion or a paradigm shift. Uh, for example, what is a paradigm? 
Well, those uh, that word has gotten into uh, popular usage, um, but and, and it can mean you know anything from something very precise to something just you know any belief in general, basically. Um, a more precise definition would be an underlying model of reality, which determines what subjects are to be studied, the kinds of questions and answers that are acceptable in that study, and how the evidence of that study is to be interpreted. Um, and, you know, I, I just read that. So <laughs> um, this idea of a paradigm shift uh, really um, comes from uh, Thomas Kuhn, uh, who wrote a, a pretty famous book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Um, amazing book. Um, absolutely required reading for anyone interested in science or, or even really modern philosophy. Um, and his idea of the paradigm shift or the paradigm change was detailed in that book. Different people have broken out the stages and, and, and labeled different parts in different ways. I have my own that I have on the website. Um, but all of them kind of map to the same basic uh, shift, that, that you've got somebody who is uh, in a worldview, if you want to call it that. They, they, they see things a certain way. They interpret things according to that worldview. And then if that kind of total view of reality ever changes, that's known as a paradigm shift. Okay. Yeah, let me ask you a question, because I know uh, a lot of non-believers, I think, would reject the idea that they operate under a paradigm, that uh, they say, no, I'm a free thinker, you know, I examine everything, I don't, I don't have a, a worldview, a paradigm. Yeah, that's, um, you know, it, it's kind of almost self-defeating to say that, because the, the idea that you're a free thinker and, and that that is the proper way to approach reality and questioning everything and evidence, all, all of that is part of the paradigm. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, so, so somebody else could have a paradigm that says, oh, I just, I just believe anything I'm told and I never look for evidence. Okay, well, that's a paradigm also. Um, it may sound ridiculous, and, and probably nobody would really want to admit to being that way. Um, right. But yeah, you've, you've, you've at least got the uh, logical possibility of those two competing paradigms, and this person has chosen one of them. Um, right. So it's, it's not, I, I don't like the, um, the rose-colored glasses analogy that a lot of people use, where, oh, you know, we're all just kind of walking around with colored glasses on, and we all see the world differently, and uh, that's not really true. We're, we're all human beings, we're all in the same reality, um, but there is definitely something in between reality and us that has to do with kind of our method, kind of our way of approaching things. Um, and these give rise to different viewpoints. And, um, and, th and that's not just true with religion. I mean, we're, t we're discussing religious conversion. Um, but Thomas Kuhn, I mean, it's right there in the title, Scientific Revolutions. Um, Kuhn actually argues that the, uh, the way most people view historic science is actually flawed, that this idea of just continual development, continual learning, um, that, that's just not the case. Uh, virtually every important scientific discovery has overturned a previous scientific paradigm. Um, yeah. So his book has nothing to do with faith. Um, uh, the, yeah. the whole idea of the paradigm shift actually came about in studying the hard sciences. So if somebody wants to be you know, a skeptic of, of religious faith and that sort of thing. Okay, well, that's fine. That's a paradigm. Um, but this whole idea actually comes from someone uh, detailing the history of science, not religion. Right. Yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah, and uh, the atheist uh, Sam Harris actually has a kind of opposite view where science progresses by a kind of eureka moment that's disconnected from the past. So, <laughs> you know, it's... it's it, no matter how you slice it or dice it, you know, you have to move from one paradigm for, to another, you know? Yeah, and it can have that appearance. And I, and I think Kuhn um, w would somewhat agree with, with Harris. It's, it's that the disconnect from history is kind of the disconnect from this, this long process, that, that there are rather startling moves from one thing to another. Now, there is a process that happens, and, and of course that process happens in history, as all things must, um, but from the outside, it, it doesn't appear to be just the continual process. Um, you're, you're jumping from uh, a geocentric to a heliocentric view of the universe. In other words, geocentrism doesn't just keep developing forever and just get better and better and better. It's that eventually someone goes, you know what, this doesn't work, and boom, 
now we have a completely different model of the universe that explains the data better. And uh, so I, I think that's kind of the idea of the paradigm shift is that you don't just start with one thing and keep developing it forever. Eventually, sometimes the, the reigning paradigm just gets completely overthrown. Yeah. So in a religious context, uh, when we're talking, uh, Catholics talking to a Protestant or, uh, uh, you know, a, a Jewish person or whatever, uh, what we have is two different uh, paradigms, and that could lead to conflict, can it? Yeah, I think that it's a useful model to look at, at conversion of any kind, really. It's, I mean, again, Kuhn kind of discovered it looking at science, but, um, you know, when you really make the stages a bit more generic and, and you change the examples around, um, you can see this in, in the overturning of any uh, major uh, thought pattern. Mm -hmm. um, and not recognizing that, again, if, if we try to reduce conversion down to just a black and white, you know, kind of a light switch, you know, it's either up or down type thing, and we don't realize what goes into making that switch, um, which, again, from the outside can appear extremely revolutionary and disconnected from the past, um, we, we're missing out on opportunities and uh, understanding because somebody is, maybe is a different point in the process and we don't even know the process is happening yeah yeah very good yeah so um so th there's uh these deep differences between competing paradigms uh it, and in your article by the way uh which is on your website uh douglasbeaumont.com it's called paradigm shift and religious conversion you kind of go through some of the uh the problems that involved with communicating to people who hold a different worldview yeah, part of what comes with a paradigm is a specialized use of vocabulary, kind of jargon, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, we all use our words to connect other minds to reality. You know, so when I say elephant, I'm communicating, yeah. <laughs> you know, that particular animal into your mind. Um, but the way we interpret those words has a lot to do with the paradigm that we are in. And so when two different paradigms develop specialized jargon, and somebody is not able to translate back and forth between the two, um, a lot of confusion can develop. Um, so, for example, you know, when, a, uh, when the, a Protestant speaks of the church, even if it's in the singular, what they usually mean is, is just sort of a, uh, an abstract collection of, of all faithful Christians in the world. It's, it's not something you can really point at as, as identifiable, but you, you just sort of define it as, yeah, you know, the, the set or the total collection of people who are actually Christians. Um, when the Catholic speaks of the church, uh, they're talking about the identifiable organization in communion with the Pope. Um, so you can imagine if, if you've got a Protestant that's unaware of Catholic jargon and vice versa, and they're talking, well, the Catholic is going to tell the Protestant... You know, you need to come into communion with the church, which is going to sound, you know, pretty rude <laughs> to someone who's already yeah. in it. That's a great example. Well, we're coming up to the break. We're talking with Dr. Douglas Beaumont about changing worldviews. Stay tuned, everybody. More to come after the break. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. 
We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Welcome back, everybody. We're talking with Dr. Douglas Beaumont about changing worldviews, paradigm shifts. And uh, we're going through uh, some of the things that we need to keep in mind when we're discussing our faith with people that have different worldviews. Uh, you could have a Protestant worldview or a Catholic worldview. And uh, uh, you just uh, you gave an excellent example, I think, of... One of the problems when you're talking with two, you know, two people with different worldviews talking to each other is uh, language, vocabulary, jargon uh, becomes very different. And uh, this, the same word may have not only different meanings, but different connotations like you, uh, uh, like you mentioned before the break. Yeah, and and I found this as I was doing my study, you know, that that oftentimes I would see someone give a very precise definition of a word and I would say, "Oh, you know, I that, that's not how I had thought of that before." <laughs> <laughs> and 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 now I can kind of make a little bit more sense out of, you know, things that that I've heard Catholics say or that I've heard Protestants say that Catholics say. And and now it makes a little bit more sense to me. Um just to give another example, um I I remember one of my major aha moments of uh, this time period was reading Thomas Aquinas' definition of faith, uh, which he basically defines as a, a, a submission to a religious authority. Okay, well, that, that's nothing like any kind of definition I had ever heard for faith. Um, as a Protestant, as an evangelical, uh, typically, well, there were numerous definitions, but they, they kind of boiled down to a, agreement with a set of statements. Um, and so it's very personal, you know, it, it, this is my faith, and, and I'm either agreeing with this other set of, of um, statements or not. Uh, submission and authority really don't come into it. And so what I came to realize was that, wow, I mean, if someone accepts this definition of faith, then I'm not sure that I have that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And, and of course, you know, you know, you're telling an evangelical they don't have faith, I mean, that, that would yeah, not right. even make sense. You know, like, why are we even having this discussion? Um, so we have to be very careful with, you know, whose jargon are we referring to when we make these kinds of statements? Yeah, yeah, that's very good. Yeah, so uh, so the Catholic might think, boy, I'm making some really good points here. But when it's fed through, you know, see, as seen through the other person's worldview, it could actually kind of be insulting and put it offish or, or just nonsensical. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, it could just not really make any sense at all. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, another thing you point out in the article I found really fascinating was the worldview also determines what can be considered and what is off the table from consideration. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, just to maybe go back to the skeptic for a moment, um, you know, you hear a lot of, of atheists that will say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to believe anything without evidence. Well, you know, there's probably a sense in which nobody does, um, you know, except for maybe very small children. But, but even then, they have the evidence of their parents telling them something's true. Um, but that kind of thing isn't going to count as evidence for, say, a scientist. You know, if, if a scientist said, well, you know, I believe that the universe is made up of atoms because my mom told me, well, <laughs> that's not acceptable <laughs> on right, a scientific yeah. paradigm. You know, that doesn't count. <laughs> um, and so... You know, faith can, again, be different as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, um, 
you know, as as a Baptist evangelical, I would have argued that infant baptism is not something that a church should practice because there's there's no instance of infant baptism in Scripture. And and what you see there is that I'm I'm actually operating on a principle. Okay, to to, to make that into a logical argument, really, what I'd have to say is uh, nothing that doesn't appear in the Bible is allowable in church. Infant baptism is not. Uh, presented in the Bible, therefore it's not allowable in church. And, you know, that principle comes from the paradigm. That that principle that nothing is allowed that's not in the Bible is part of my paradigm. So if if as a Baptist I tell a Catholic infant baptism is not allowable because it's not in the Bible, the Catholic's probably not going to really understand my argument because they don't have that paradigm. Right. Um, in their paradigm, uh, uh, assertions of faith and practice come from more than just one source, namely Scripture. Um, and so if that doesn't get hashed out, there's going to be a lot of talking uh, across one another without really making any progress, because really the disagreement is not so much over infant baptism. It's it's a disagreement over the principle of how we even come up with what's allowable. And yeah. failure to recognize that is, is going to keep the conversation from moving forward. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, you know, I've encountered people who, uh, for example, if you're talking to a seven day Adventist, uh, the notion of Sunday worship is completely off the table because they equate that with, uh, you know, uh, d demonic, you know, they, they won't even consider that. Uh, I know we're kind of, I may be going a little ahead of our discussion, but, uh, what do you do then? I mean, is there a hierarchy within this paradigm that I could maybe look at some other more basic principles and then address that? Or, yeah, I think you know, in 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 regular everyday speech, we typically don't form uh, complete you know logical syllogisms <laughs> when we talk. Yeah. It, it would just be cumbersome, and and you know, nobody would do that. Um, but there are times I think where we have to stop and say, okay, hold up. Um, you said this conclusion based on this premise, um, but that's not enough. There has to be a principle behind that that gets you there. So let's figure out what that is. Okay. So why is, you know, the conclusion is Sunday worship is demonic. Um, why do you think that? Well, because, you know, the, the, the Bible says you worship on Saturday. Okay, so then let's look at the principle. The principle is, and, and you go from there, uh, moving forward, and when you get down to the level of principle, it's usually a lot um, easier to discuss, to, to me, because I can go back and forth with the Seventh-day Adventist all day long. Yeah, but New Testament says it's the Lord's Day. Well, when did, you know, when did that become this, and when did that become that? And, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're just going to keep, you know, kind of playing, you know, Scripture ping pong um, so long as we haven't identified that underlying principle. Um, so the underlying principle for the Seventh-day Adventists might be um, any law that God puts forward can never be changed. Um, or it might be um, the laws that God gave Old Testament Israel are for all people at all times. Or, you know, in other words, I, I need to find what, what's the rest of your argument? Because you can't just get from there's something in the Old Testament Therefore, you have to do it today, because there's lots of stuff in the Old Testament that Seventh-day Adventists don't do. So there has to be something else. There has to be some other principle operating here, or else you're being inconsistent. So let's figure out what that is, and then see if we agree or disagree, and if so, how. Yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah, uh, I like that. That's, that's a great way to put it. Well, why don't we jump to uh, paradigm shift and religious conversion? Um, Okay, what what's involved with uh, changing one's worldview from one to another thing? Yeah, um, you know, s saying this over the air is is going to probably be a little confusing if you don't have like a little <laughs> chart in front of you. Um, and, and again, this is this is my own adaptation of of this. There, there's been others. Um, I, I stole from the best, though. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good. That's what you should do. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, w w without getting too much into all the individual words, people can look those up later. But, um, you know, initially yeah. when somebody is in a certain paradigm, I, I call it stasis. It's, it's the time where basically you're kind of happy with the way things are. Your paradigm makes sense. The world makes sense to you. Um, probably during that time, nothing is, is going to change. There's no change on the horizon. Um, what, what starts the uh, cycle is when aberrations appear 
that you can't explain very well with your paradigm. It's like, hmm, that doesn't really fit the way I think the world works. Um, and so you have to start looking into that if, if you want to, you know, not, you know, drive yourself crazy. Um, and, yeah. and if the aberrations start really piling up and you start kind of breaking free from your paradigm a little bit, kind of drifting away, um, that's the next stage is, would be drift, um, okay. is where your paradigm has been weakened um, and you've got to alter it somehow to keep it viable. You know, like these aberrations are serious. Th this, is, this is a threat to my paradigm and I've got to find some way to tweak it to, to make sense of those things. Okay, so um, if you, can you give us an example of like a, what would be a, an aberration that would require rethinking? Yeah, well, I, you know, for me, um, I, I guess it'd probably be the easiest uh, illustration to give um, was as I started studying the background of Scripture and its interpretation, I started realizing that my evangelical paradigm wasn't really able to account for that. You know, so we we believed that the Bible was the Word of God, but then when it came to well. How, how do we know what actually is in the Bible? Like, where, where did this table of contents come from? Um, suddenly I realized that I, I'm not at bedrock yet. You know, I, I've got some good reasons to think these books should be in the Bible, but I'm still not at a, a decisive, you know, principle here um, within evangelicalism. And then further, e even if I do know what constitutes the Bible, you know, how do I know when I've arrived at the correct interpretation, especially given, you know, the, the massive... Uh, array of beliefs that the Bible has generated. So the difficulty I had was that my evangelical faith, evangelical paradigm, didn't have satisfactory answers. And, and, and as much as I tried to adjust <laughs> um, right. my paradigm to account for those things, it wasn't working. And, and that's, that's when you, you move into the third stage, which is crisis. And this is where you start to realize, oh my gosh, this paradigm doesn't work. I can't fix it. <laughs> you know, I, I, can't, I can't just tweak it a little bit. And, and you know, um, so for me, this was Anglicanism. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, spent a, spent a year or two there going, you know, please, you know, rescue me from the Catholic Church, because that, that seems to be, you know, what's the next step. Um, right. But, uh, you know, crisis, you, you stay there, um, kind of, you're still in the old paradigm, you have these aberrations that you can't explain, you don't know what to do about it, and, and that creates a time of crisis um, that, that has to be resolved. I, I need to find a resolution to these aberrations of my paradigm, and I'm starting to realize that I'm, I'm going to have to find them outside of the paradigm. I'm going to have to go to a different one. And so at that yeah. point, that's when um, you, you start really looking to replace the paradigm. Like, what, what is something that will replace my old paradigm? It, it can explain the stuff that the old one did, but it can also deal with those aberrations and resolve those. And then if you find that, your paradigm shift has been made and you're back to the beginning again in a new paradigm. Okay. Yeah, very good. I, I love this breakdown of four steps. It makes a lot of sense and it, it fits with a you know, all the data out there. We're talking with Dr. Douglas Beaumont about uh, paradigm shift and religious conversion. Uh, more on the other side of the break. Stay tuned, folks. You're listening to Hands On Apologetics. More to come. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. 
It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. We are chatting with Master Apologist Dr. Douglas Beaumont on uh, paradigm shifts, changing worldviews. And, uh, you know, uh, after during the break, I was thinking, you know, what's the driving force that moves somebody from... Like you said, stasis, where uh, you know they're they're comfortable within their worldview, then they encounter aberrations. They, there's a drift, and then there is a crisis eventually because you realize that your paradigm can't account for you know all these aberrations, and then eventually you find a paradigm that does account for it. Uh, ultimately, isn't the driving force just uh, this demand for coherence that all of us demand that uh, all of reality makes sense? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, the, the human mind, um, it, it always seeks unity, um, that, that what my thought life is should reflect reality. Um, that's just part of being human and having an intellect. Um, and so when we believe something that doesn't seem to account for what we experience in reality, that bugs us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, when, when there's things we don't know, we want to know them. Um, and so these aberrations things that don't fit with the paradigm are kind of signals that there's something you don't know. Um, you know, just to back up to my story a bit, um, like I said at the beginning of the program, I came to faith a little later in life. Um, I was an adult. But I, I had been thinking about these sorts of things for quite some time, and, and most of the people that had witnessed to the Christian faith um, I always tried to ask them really hard questions, and it wasn't until those questions started getting answered that I found myself really needing to deal with the Christian question. Um, and I, I, you know, I had really stupid objections, but I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, after a couple of good Christian apologists answered those, I, I had to sit down and think, wow, you know, my paradigm that was Christianity is stupid, basically, um, has been seriously challenged. You know, these guys are smart, and they know things, and they've answered my objections. Um, and so I've got to deal with that. I've, I've either got to prove to myself that the objections were legitimate, or I need to, you know, take Christianity seriously. And the same sort of thing happened uh, later with uh, my doctoral studies, you know, I, I ended up studying apologetics, moved clear across, you know, our great nation, um, you know, left everything behind to go study at Southern Evangelical Seminary, because at the time, it was one of the few schools in the nation that actually had a, an emphasis on defending the faith, on apologetics. And so, you know, here I am 10, 15 years later, and I'm suddenly realizing that, you know, at, at bottom, I'm still defending things that I don't really feel like I've got a complete um, c command of. You know, if, if somebody really asked me some hard questions about Scripture and, and where we got our canon, where we got our table of contents, I wouldn't be able to answer those. Um, when somebody asked me, you know, how of the dozens and dozens and dozens of interpretations of virtually every Christian doctrine are out there, how do you know which one's right, and, and does it matter, and how do you tell which ones matter and which ones don't? You know, I, I just kept falling back on my own thinking, and I thought, well, gosh, I mean, I'm not the authority here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't decide what's in the Bible. I didn't write the Nicene Creed. Um, 
And so eventually I had to adjust my paradigm and the adjustment wasn't working because evangelicalism wasn't around back then either. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and I eventually realized that, yeah, I mean, if, if I want to be consistent with the fact that I have this table of contents of a Bible and not another, and I have this interpretation of it and not another, uh, I kept finding those in the Catholic Church. And that is not a compatible paradigm with evangelicalism, which rejects the Catholic Church. Um, and so eventually, the only way for those aberrations to be resolved was to be in a different paradigm. And, and that's when conversion took place. Yeah, very good. So you move from from stasis to drift, and then crisis when you realize that uh, your current paradigm just doesn't work, and then eventually that shift to a different paradigm, which is Catholicism. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah. you know that that was you know I mean it, I won't go into details now, but I mean it, it was obviously a very difficult uh, transition to go through. I mean I'm, I'm working at a seminary. All of my colleagues, the, the entire ministry network I've built for the last you know decade, um, is is going to be involved if if, yeah. if this happens. Right. And, um, you know, I, part of the reason that we, uh, we did Evangelical Exodus was to give a lot of, a lot of people have come out of Southern Evangelical Seminary and become Catholic. And I, I, I had seen the fallout of that because I was behind the scenes and, and I was hearing what people were saying about these guys. Um, and knowing that I was probably, they're going to probably say the same things about me when I left, uh, which they did. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, um, you know, what I started to realize was these guys definitely, they, they do not have any grasp of what is involved in this in this move. Um, you know, I was being accused of, of being a crypto-Catholic. You know, I mean, they made it sound like we had some kind of secret cabal, you know, meeting down <laughs> in the basement. You know, ooh, you know, we're going to read the catechism and not tell anybody. And, um, you know, like there was just this, this big, you know, conspiracy going on. And, and it was nothing right. like that. I mean, we were struggling. I mean... You know, 99% of the conversations I had back then were, here's all the problems we have. How can we avoid becoming Catholic? I mean, you know, nobody wanted yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, so, that is part of their paradigm is because yeah, they, it can't be that individuals are independently coming up with the belief that certain things about Catholicism is true because the Catholicism can't be true. So it, there has to be a cabal. That's yeah. That's a very. I'm going to steal that. Um, that's a very insightful uh, <laughs> point. That that yeah. You know, given the evangelical process of coming to faith, which is, you know, almost completely private. You know, privately held uh, opinions. Um, yeah. The the only good reason to become Catholic is if you privately want that to happen. Um, right. You know, the, the, there's there's a, a big part of the will involved there, and. Um, they don't realize that, no, I mean, that, that, that's at the very, very, very end <laughs> right. of the paradigm shift is where you actually welcome the change. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's at that point that, you know, maybe you feel relief, like, oh, thank goodness, you know, my, you know the world makes sense again. Um, you know, something along those lines. But, but it was never like this gleeful rush, you know, to embrace Rome. Um, right. You know, I, yeah. most of us had several stops along the way. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just never. It was never like that. Um, yeah. We weren't looking for this. So th this was something many of us almost felt forced into because I, I just I can't keep thinking that the Bible's true and da, da 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 if if I don't embrace the church that gave it to us. Yeah, very good. And the name of the book, by the way, is Evangelical Exodus: Evangelical Seminarians and Their Path to Rome. I, I have a couple questions for you. Um, is it possible if you're in? Uh, your worldview, is it possible to um, faithfully and understand another person's wor worldview? I mean, is it possible as you as an evangelical to correctly understand the worldview of a Catholic or Jehovah Witnesses or vice versa? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think a lot of it just starts with, with just respecting the fact that, um, you know, these people probably are not totally insane. <laughs> yeah, right. um, you know, they actually have principled reasons for thinking the way they do about sure. things. And, and if, if, if something that somebody believes just seems absolutely stupid, um, I'm probably the one that is ignorant. Um, it doesn't mean I'm wrong, but it means I'm ignorant because 
most people are not totally stupid and, and believe totally stupid things for no reason. Um, right. You know, one one thing I like to do when I give this talk live is is I'll start off by giving some of the arguments for the flat Earth. Um, and everybody laughs, and it's all ridiculous. And I say, okay, well, how many of you can answer these arguments right now? And, you know, almost never is there a hand up. I say, well, <laughs> then why are you sitting there laughing at this? You know, I, I've just given you arguments that you can't answer. So why do you still think it's funny? Right. You know, and, and it's kind of a humbling moment to realize, wow, I, I think these guys are idiots, and yet I can't answer their arguments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that's great. And so, you know, when you dig down a little bit and say, okay, you know, the way I need to understand you is I can't just look at a list of your conclusions. I have to also see the principles and the arguments behind them. And once I see that and I understand your vocabulary, uh, then I, I can move pretty freely back and forth between the two, uh, even if I don't have um, really strong um, existential experience in that worldview, I, I can at least make sense of it to where you seem logical, you seem reasonable, um, and I understand what you're saying when you talk. And I think at that point, that is really the beginning of fruitful dialogue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, we only have uh, maybe two more minutes. Uh, so uh, can you give us some practical advice? Like if I'm talking to a person who's pro-choice, you know, has a very pro-choice worldview, or, uh, you know, anything else, where would you start? Would it be uh, to focus on... Uh, data that doesn't fit their worldview, like aberrations, or uh, where would you start? Well, I think there's, there's two steps. One is, is getting to the, the level of principle. You know, I, I need to know why you think abortion's okay, um, because probably you're not pro-murder, <laughs> yeah, right. um, you know, at least in, in other contexts. So there has to be something more than just, I want babies to die. Um, I don't think anybody really thinks that. Um, and then when I get your principle, I can start applying it to things that I don't think you agree with. And, and that, I think, is where you start to expose the problems. Um, you know, that, for example, you know, we talked about infant baptism. If, if a Baptist says, well, I don't believe in infant baptism because it's nowhere in the Bible, I can go, okay, so the principle is whatever isn't in the Bible is not okay in church. Well, let me ask you this. Do you give communion to women? Well, yeah. Okay, but there's nowhere in Scripture where we see any women receiving communion, so why do you do that? Yeah, yeah very good. And now they kind of go, oh, you know, maybe that principle doesn't really work. I, I either need to change it, or I need to nuance it, or I need to do something, but that's, that's not going to work anymore. I need a new argument. And then as they start puzzling through that in their own minds, they might come to realize. So, um, you know, so with the pro-choice person, you might say, okay, well, you know, my definition of murder is this. Uh, what's yours? And then if they give you one that fits abortion, you can say, well, then it sounds like abortion is murder, and you can go from there. Um, okay. If they give another one, like maybe a definition that we don't agree with, then try to find some particulars that they would definitely agree is murder, um, but fits their paradigm. So, for example, if they say, well, it has to be illegal, that's kind of a favorite tactic with a lot of people, you know, um, Killing an innocent person is not murder as long as it's legal. Well, then you have the obvious uh, example of, of Nazi Germany. Um, you know, genocides all over the world have been legal. Yeah. Um, you don't think that's murder? You don't think, you know, the, you know, the millions that have died, you know, communism are murder? Well, yeah, I think those are murder. Okay, well, then let's change our... In other words, so you, you have to get the principle and then find a particular that that principle doesn't work with. Very good. Well, hey, thank you so much for coming on the show. I, I've learned a ton. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Always a pleasure. All right. Well, that is uh, Dr. Douglas Beaumont. Check out, you know, this is a great article. It's on its website, www.douglasbeaumont.com. Uh, also, lots of other great material. He's had lots of books, including Evangelical Exodus, which I recommend. Man, the hour has flown, folks. You know, it's already time to... Shut down the Midwest Command Center and turn off the lights here at the dojo. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And as always, after the program, uh, with high-intensity Catholic talk coming at you with the Terry and Jesse Show. Wish everybody have a blessed day. Bye-bye. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were open to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. 
That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic Audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic Audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.